The United States pulls out of the UN Human Rights Council, calling it a cesspool of political bias. So what will this mean for the global fight to protect human rights? And will this further isolate the US on the world stage? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Peter Dobby. The US has walked out of the UN Human Rights Council, calling it hypocritical, self-serving and a cesspool of political bias. The move follows months of threats from President Donald Trump to pull out of the UN Council. The United States has long had a conflicted relationship with the UN HRC and says it has to be reformed. The announcement came at a time when President Trump faces widespread and vociferous condemnation for his zero-tolerance immigration policy that's separating children from their families on the U.S.-Mexico border. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, for Inside Story, Ros Jordan has this report. No special a year ago, the, the U.S. Rights ambassador Council to the United Nations called. criticized the U.N. The Human Rights Council for what she called its hypocritical behavior. And Nikki Haley and said the U.S. would quit the Council if it didn't change its ways. It's hard to accept that this council has never considered a resolution on Venezuela, and yet it adopted five biased resolutions in March against a single country, Israel. It is essential that this council address its chronic anti-Israel bias if it is to have any credibility. It is correct to criticize the state of Israel for its actions. As said by Rabbi Lutz, you can, you can challenge the Israeli government's policies without being anti-Semitic. Comments such as this, a permanent agenda item investigating Israel's treatment of Palestinians, and the U.S.'s recent failure to prevent the U.N. General Assembly from condemning Israel's use of force in Gaza, finally made the Trump administration say enough on Tuesday. But when organizations undermine our national interests and our allies, we will not be complicit. When they seek to infringe on our national sovereignty, we will not be silent. We take this step because our commitment does not allow us to remain a part of a hypocritical and self-serving organization that makes a mockery of human rights. We could have withdrawn immediately. We did not do that. Instead, we made a good faith effort to resolve the problems. The U.S. has had a troubled relationship with the Council. When it was set up in 2006, President George Bush refused to join because he feared countries with poor human rights records would be able to sit on a panel intended to punish human rights violators. Key in Bush's decision making, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. at the time, John Bolton. He's now President Trump's national security advisor. President Barack Obama then joined the council in 2009. He argued the U.S. would have more influence and give Israel more protection from negative resolutions in the process. Now the U.S. is leaving the council again, and that has human rights groups around the world very concerned. They fear that without the American presence on the council, it will be much less able to hold countries such as Russia, Syria, or North Korea accountable for the mistreatment of their citizens. It's also not clear how long Washington plans to stay away from the Human Rights Council. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, the State Department. Well, the Council is based in Geneva and its mission is to promote and to protect human rights around the world. It was established back in 2006 to replace the UN Commission on Human Rights that had been strongly criticized for allowing countries with poor human rights records to be members. The UNHRC has 47 member countries who serve for three-year terms. It meets three times a year and investigates human rights records of all UN member states in a special process. It covers issues including freedom of expression, freedom of belief, women's rights, LGBT rights and the rights of racial and ethnic minorities. The UN General Assembly can suspend the rights of any council member that's violated human rights in a gross and systematic way. This requires a two-thirds majority vote. Let's get going. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us from Geneva, Guillaume Charon. He's the director of Independent Diplomat. In London, we have Rosa Friedman, professor of law and global development at the University of Reading. And joining us from Washington is Mohamed Sharakao, 
Professor of Conflict Resolution at the George Mason University. Welcome to you all. Guillaume, coming to you first, what does this decision do to the organization? Well, um, the decision is not really one that comes as a surprise in Geneva. Everyone that's been following the Human Rights Council in Geneva has been expecting it ever since Nikki Haley came to Geneva in June of last year and said that, in essence, she wanted the council to reform around three pillars. Uh, the first one is its membership. The second one is its perceived bias uh, on it towards Israel. And the third one is its uh, efficiency. I think that here the, the shock is really, the surprise is really that it comes so suddenly, uh, in a way. Even though we had seen it coming, most would have expected that there'd be a trigger, say, for instance, the UN publishing a report condemning Israel or something of the kind. But in any case, I think most people expected it. And, um, and the biggest concern nowadays is what, what, you know, how this is going to unfold um, a year and a half away from the reform of the Human Rights Council. Uh, the Human Rights Council itself is due to be reformed in 2020. And, um, you know, this withdrawal poses a lot of questions on that. Rosa, what does it also say about where the organization stands today and why didn't it react to those demands from Nikki Haley to reform? I think that there are many countries, many NGOs that agree with the US about the need for reform. It was the way that the US was going about trying to reform the body that I think caused this trigger, this, this reaction and this walking out in, in quite an immediate manner. Essentially, the US wanted to, to sponsor resolutions on reform, whereas these, these things have to be cross-regional, they have to have co-sponsors and be championed by many countries. And the way that the US was pushing for reform um, was by floating resolutions uh, without first garnering support and then reacting very badly when those uh, floated resolutions were being pushed off the table. And Mohammed, what does it also tell us about the current direction of travel for the Trump administration? Well, it is a dark day in the U.S. history. It contradicts all the morals and institutions that have been established either since the Puritan times in colonial America or according to the Wilsonian uh, doctrine that gave us the League of Nations and then contributed to the establishment of the U.N. nation systems. Unfortunately, the uh, Trump administration now is exiting this uh, global human rights paradigm for the sake of being isolated, isolated and also for showing some uncalled for sympathy to the Israelis. So I think the problem here is that the United States is going to lose its main reference of moral politics, human rights and all the humanity that it has championed over centuries. Rosa, when Mohammed talks about uncalled for sympathy for the Israelis, part of this, as far as Nikki Haley is concerned, is this Article 7, which means that they always have to, they are constituted in such a way, they always have to talk about Israel at every meeting. And that's why we've seen the reaction that we've seen today from Benjamin Netanyahu. Look, um, ever since the council was created, there has been bias. There has been excessive, disproportionate scrutiny of Israel. We've seen that the UN Human Rights Council has spent more time and resources talking about Israel than it has about North Korea, Yemen, South Sudan, Sudan and Darfur and Sri Lanka combined. But that, that bias, it's not a perception, that actual bias against Israel is not a reason to leave the Human Rights Council. It is a reason to reform and work with the Council. And in fact, when Item 7 was per first placed on the agenda, the reason that it wasn't blocked by European Union states was it was hoped that the discussion of Israel and Palestine would be contained to those two days at the session. Since it is not contained to those two days and Israel is raised in all sorts of other agenda items, many countries have simply stopped engaging with Item 7. So there are ways around it, and the US knows that there are ways around it, but this is almost a good excuse and a good national populist excuse for the US walking out of the room. Guillaume, what do you think the chances are that the United States might go back in again? They left before under George W. Bush when he was a Republican president, but they chose under Obama to, to join up and sign up to the statutes one more time. I mean, it's going to be difficult to predict, but to be honest, I don't foresee them coming back 
before 2020, so i.e. before the reforms uh, are, are uh, discussed and, and, and that there is a new, uh, that there is a new body or, or, or that the reforms are in place. I think that the message is pretty clear. In fact, I think the big question is whether these reforms or whether this would allow for the U.S. to return at all. And, um, and I agree with what Rosa and, and, and Mohammed have just said. In many ways, it, it, it creates a void. I mean, when you're trying to negotiate for a reform and you're not there in the room negotiating, it creates a void. And, and, and certain countries, other countries, are more than happy to fill that void. Insofar as I can see, and my, my biggest concern is civil society. The Human Rights Council has been one of the few UN avenues for engagement for civil society actors. Um, I, I agree that, I mean, I, I hear Rosa's points with regards to the uh, Israel bias and, or, or, or the discussions, the, 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 the weight that's given on, on, on the record, the human rights record of Israel. But at the same time, I must say that it's one of the very few conduits where we've had discussions on accountability at all at the UN. Uh, I'm thinking, and, and with the engagement of civil society, I'm thinking, you know, it's had 28 commissions of inquiry, uh, not just on Gaza, but also on the Myanmar. Um, and look at, uh, for instance, Syria is one of the very few places where we've had so much, um, you know, there's been an independent investigative body looking into the, 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 the violations committed by the Syrian government there and so on. So, so this has pr provided for a room for civil society engagement like nowhere else. I mean, there's over probably 100, probably 1,000 of NGOs active in there. And the big fear is that this U.S. withdrawal, creating that void, would allow certain other countries uh, to fill it. And these other countries which are coming to the fray, uh, I'm thinking, for instance, China with its win-win uh, uh, resolution, which they tabled recently, um, is, it, it remains unknown as to how much space they would want to give to the NGOs. I mean, when I say unknown, this is a diplomatic term. I mean, many countries, the U.S. was part of the groups of states that was favorable and supportive of uh, the engagement of civil society actors. Um, so that, that is probably one of the biggest question marks on that. Mohammed, in Washington, if there is now a void, and there clearly is on the ranks of the, within the ranks of the council, those other countries that look to the United States to be the high watermark of not just international law and how it's applied, but also the nexus of morality, international morality, if you will, and the law. Who do they look to now? Well, before I address your question, let me add a couple of issues here. I think we should not overcredit the support for Israel in explaining or deconstructing this decision. I think we should mention also that there is a personal, uh, there is also a political factor. The personal factor is that Trump seeks to become the king that America had never had. In other words, he wants to free himself up from all these institutions and accountability. Also, this decision can be considered as an investment in the right-wing evangelical base where he is basically telling them that you are better off with us as right-wingers. And he is also taking into consideration this investment toward the elections next November at the Congress level and also later on in 2020. To address your question, I think, yes, there will be a vacuum where there will be no leadership, no point of reference, and no uh, final kind of uh, text or manifesto that sort of uh, explains to the rest of the world that there is a system. So basically, this is a move beyond the establishment, beyond the international institution that is the UN that has oversighted uh, this uh, a business of human rights. Otherwise, in other words, we are going to be moving on uncharted grounds in terms of what to do when some human rights are fringed or encroached upon. Therefore, the Trump administration is now driving the world into the wilderness. And the worst part here is that he is undermining the UN system. If we do without or if we abandon this system, then I think we become uh, in a, we live, we will be living in a coitic situation. Rosa, I think you wanted to come in there. I, I'd like, I, 
I'd like to come in there. I, I think that we're overstating the case of the US leaving the Human Rights Council and the impact that this will have on the Council and on the whole UN system. Trump has already taken money away from peacekeeping budgets, from the UN Population Fund, from other parts of the United Nations system, and other countries have stepped up to fill that void. Within the Human Rights Council, the European Union is very strong. The UK is very agile, very effective, with a very large mission. And yes, we will see a void by the US not having its mission, not having its, its institutional knowledge, and particularly its leadership on human rights. But there are other countries we can look to, particularly Latin American countries, who, because of the geographic distance between them and Geneva, don't always play as strong a role as perhaps we might want them to. We can look to these countries and expect them to step up and fill the void and to push back against the countries like China, who are trying to undermine human rights, who are trying to say state sovereignty is more important, or the countries like Egypt and India, who block NGOs from being accredited to the UN system. Um, I'm just a little bit worried that if we all say that the Human Rights Council will collapse as a result of the US leaving, we're actually, we're actually forgetting that there are 193 member states and no one state is, is more important than the remainder of them together. Well, Donald Trump has pulled the US out of several international agreements, including the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, which was reached with other world powers to curb Tehran's nuclear program in exchange for easing sanctions. The Paris Climate Accord, which is working to tackle global warming, signed also in 2015 by 190 countries. The US has also withdrawn from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a 12-nation trade deal that covers almost 40% of the world's economy, and the UN Global Agreement on Migration that pledges to uphold the rights of refugees and help them to resettle in another country. Rosa, can I come back to you, though? When you talk about that agility that's that's all well and good and we accept that of course but has the car has the time come for the council which it seems to me is like a work in progress almost they haven't quite got it right because you're all saying the same thing there are valid criticisms here but they, they did launch commissions on uh, north korea south sudan nothing came of that so the delivery of how they react to the information that they bring in is never pushed through well First of all, we have to understand that the council <clears throat> is an intergovernmental body. Member states send their diplomats to represent national interests. And so it will always be a political body and it won't have legally binding powers. It has soft powers, unlike expert bodies that are more like quasi-judicial powers. The commissions of inquiry, the fact-finding, the information sharing, this has been a game changer for human rights. Unlike the previous body, the commission, the council meets throughout the year. It is webcast. Anyone can access it, members of the public, NGOs. It provides information that is used by the Security Council, that's used by regional bodies, because gr grave violations of human rights often are a precursor to threats to international peace and security. We've seen so much positive work at the Council. And yes, there are always going to be problems. There are reforms that are needed. The membership issue is one that has, has been there since the Council began. How do, we, how do we enforce soft membership criteria? How do we encourage... African, Af the African group as a regional group to stop putting forward countries like Democratic Republic of Congo or Burundi who are violating human rights on a massive scale as candidates. But these are things that can be addressed, can be worked out. This body is only 12 years old. And as with all institutions, changes are needed. But that doesn't mean that we should negate the fact that so much good work has been done at this body. Guillaume, in Geneva, uh, Nikki Haley tried to name and shame Venezuela. Why is it the Council, during its lifetime, has never held a specific singular session on Venezuela? I mean, it was up to the US to actually call for a special session on Venezuela. Uh, they haven't done so. Uh, they're, they were a member of the Council. They're not sitting on the margins. They were a standing member of it. There were many opportunities to actually do some work on Venezuela. I, I think that, I mean, I have to accept, I mean, I, I accept what Rosa said. Uh, the, the, the council is still very much active. It has had several successes. And it brings to the four questions that weren't necessarily, um, how would I say, tackled previously. I mean, from questions from LGBTQ um, to bloggers in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. And, um, and, and, and the Venezuela, actually, issue is coming to the fore more so around what you were mentioning earlier, the global compact and the refugee issues. Um, and to be honest, another sign of the days 
um, is that actually it's other European countries that are starting to actually come to the fore on the issue. Let's not forget that, for instance, the Venezuela issue is impacting the Latin American countries that are around it, uh, as well as European countries. I think of the Netherlands, which has a, a little tiny island off of Venezuela, which is receiving a massive influx of refugees. And so all these countries, there is still a multilateral life to it. In fact, as independent diplomat, we're very active on that front. We definitely see uh, the Netherlands, as an example, Scandinavian countries, Canada, but also Latin American countries are coming to the fore. Uh, several African countries are also quite active. South Africa is very active at the Human Rights Council. Uh, it's, not a, it's not because the U.S. withdrew that all of a sudden we have an implosion of that system. It's actually very much still alive, uh, just like the Paris uh, Agreement is very much alive. And, and we've seen that countries do step up, and this is good. Guillaume, I mean, I'm going to interrupt you there, for which I apologize, because there are a couple system. of other points that I do want to get to as we head towards the end of the program. Mohammed in Washington, are there other organizations, other agreements that the United States may yet still withdraw from? Well, I think the window is open because uh, Trump remains a dogmatic leader who is anti establishment, anti alliance, anti global. He is the non-global president of the entire U.S. history. Basically, he wants to push America as far as he could from the rest of the world. So it's not just an Atlantic Ocean. There is a deeper ideological and cultural ocean between the United States now and the rest of the world. I also would like to mention, I've served on one of the UN panels of experts, and I sensed there was strong alliance between the so-called P3, U.S., Britain, and France. And now I can see this alliance kind of breaking away. And I think there is a silver line in, in Trump's decision to exit the Human Rights uh, Council. Since Germany, France, and to a large extent the U.K., are now trying to restore the values of liberal democracy. So I think in the long run, the world will look up to Europe more than the United States. And I think this is a corrective move on the European side, since Trump now is no longer the moral or the leader of this Western paradigm. Rosa, you clearly believe that the Council and the UN is safe. Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, today saying she thinks there's an outside chance the US may withdraw from the UN. So my final question to you is this. Is the United States heading towards being a rogue state? He praises Kim Jong-un. He puts a coach and horses through the Iran nuclear deal, NAFTA, TPP, the G7, which is looking like it's going to become the G6 and the G1 at loggerheads. I mean, how far is the United States prepared to go, given what Nikki Haley has done today? I, I don't imagine that the US will withdraw wholly from the UN. Indeed, I don't think it will give up its permanent seat on the Security Council because that seat brings with it power. I think that where it comes to issues that Trump doesn't care about, human rights, the environment, anything essentially that isn't about trade and about wealth creation, um, he's likely to continue to withdraw from institutions or from agreements or simply follow the path of what the US has always done and not sign up to treaties in the first place. But I don't believe that the UN is at threat of the US withdrawal. I do believe that the UN needs to recalibrate. I think that nations need to come together within all of these multilateral institutions and think about how to fill the void. And ultimately, we're going to have to weather the storm until Trump is no longer president. Guillaume in Geneva, the last word to you in about the next 30 seconds or so. Would it be fair to say this US administration is not changing just the United States? It's also changing the rest of the world. And we don't know yet if it's changing it for the worse or for the better. I would say that this decision from the US is forcing everyone to actually change their game. So we have countries which are forced to step up. As Mohammed has said, I fully see it in Geneva. Uh, and certain countries which are coming to the fore to try to compete. And in that sense, they actually, China and the US sort of look the same, which is an embarrassing situation for the US's traditional allies in Europe. Uh, but I would say also that for civil society, it's also a challenging time. They have to actually be the change they want to see. And that could also be an opportunity. At ID, we're definitely trying to encourage that movement and working with them.
Um, I think that this engagement of the, uh, at the Human Rights Council should continue. And let's see how the new, uh, the, how the discussions around the reform will play out. Okay, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much. Thanks to our guests, Guillaume Charon, uh, Rosa Friedman, and Mohamed Chirakao. And thank you to you too for your company. You can see the program again via the website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter at AJ Inside Story or tweet me. I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby One, one word. That's it from me, Peter Dobby, and the team here in Doha. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye bye.